so a annual conference is one of those times where, where you come together and you celebrate all that's happening in the life of ministry. But inevitably, what happens is that, that, that your clergy colleagues will come together and they will want to start impressing upon you how busy they are. All the things that they're doing in their churches, how, the hours that they're spending, they're doing this and they're doing that and they don't go to bed till you know, the next morning and, and they're constantly serving and doing and all of those things. And I tell you what, it makes me weary. It makes me weary to, to, to be involved in those kind of conversations because what happens is, is in case you haven't learned a little bit about it, there's a little bit of a competitive spirit in me. And uh, when I hear those things, it makes me want to do even more. And, and I tell you what, you really have to safeguard that. Because I truly believe that as I read the Bible, and, and, I, and I hope that as you read the Scriptures, that we all come to the conclusion that, that God created us to, to love Him, to love each other, and to go about His works into the world. But God didn't create us to constantly be so busy that we never have time for anything that is of value. In fact, we know that um, rest is so important that as we read in the Genesis story, it says that after God created everything, that He took a day of rest. He took a holiday. He went on vacation. He took a Sabbath, and he enjoyed that time that, that he had to just rest and to unwind and to not be so busy going about the business of creation. You know, as I uh, think about it, one of the most sacred opportunities that we have as a people is to have a meal at the dinner table together. I grew up in a family, I wrote about this a, a couple months ago in one of my blogs, that, that I used to always look forward to the Sunday dinner, coming together, and my mom would always make pot roasts, and pot roast was with potatoes and gravy and uh, gravy bread and all those kinds of things. That's why I'm such a small guy. And, uh, you know, we, she would make all of those things, but the thing that I loved about it was my three brothers and I and my mom and dad, and oftentimes maybe some friends from the neighborhood, we would all gather at the table, and we would have dinner together. But, you know, today it's a lot different than that. In fact, since 1978, we find out that we're becoming so busy in all that we're doing and engaged in the busyness and the hurriedness of the world that it's grown from 16 to 40 percent the number of people that no longer have dinner, number of families that no longer have dinner together at, at a common table. It's grown by that much. And instead of coming together as a common dinner, what we're doing is we're going through the drive throughs and we're eating all that healthy food that comes from some of those chains, right? And that's where we get, you know, the point of, of our sustenance. But we are missing what it means to come together and to share those kinds of things. You know, uh, we're so hurried and so busy. The other day, I was driving, and I was noticing a couple of things. There was a, there was a person in the car. They were putting on lipstick, talking on the cell phone, smoking a cigarette, and, uh, and texting at the same time. And, uh, you know, and I wonder, you know, where do we find time to do that stuff? I drove by one guy on Highway 19. This is, this is I'm, I'm telling the truth here, and I always do. But, uh, you know, I was driving down Highway 19, and he was actually reading the newspaper, unfolded, reading it across the steering wheel as he was driving. And he was looking down and looking up, and he was reading the best that he could. Are we in that much of a hurry? I mean, think about it, the challenges and the things that we have. I want to give you a test this morning. I want to give you a test to find out if you're in a hurry. And those of you that are at home today, I'm going to give you that same test, and I want you to check your hurriedness, your busyness, and your calendar to make sure. This is a test to find out if you're living a life of hurry sickness. Now, when you're, when you're actually doing something and you're taking care of something, does your mind start to wander about the other things that you still need to do? That's a sign of hurried sickness. Another one would be that, that um, you know, if you get to the end of the day, and if you're like me, you kind of make a to-do list. Because, you know, I like to make a to-do list because I like to cross things off because it actually makes me feel better that I accomplished something. And uh, usually it's all the honeydews that Patty has for me. Those rise to the top, you know. But, but I start checking things off. And, and, but, but, you know, if you, if you do that, if you make a list, and at the end of the day, if you look at that list and you get exasperated that you didn't get anything done on that list because you were busy doing other things, then you probably are suffering from hurry sickness. Now, here's another one. Is your life run by the schedule app on your iPhone or your cell phone? You know, if, if your schedule is constantly beeping and making noises at you and all those things all throughout the day to remind you that it's another appointment, another opportunity, another thing to do, then you too might continuously be serving or sensing and, and undergoing hurry sickness. 
I was talking with some friends not long ago, and they were saying to me that, that you know, when the, when the technology revolution came, that it was supposed to be a time that, that we could actually relax a little bit more. Because, you know, the computers would work, do all the work for us. They would do all the hard number crunching. We would merely build a spreadsheet, load some data in, and just let the computer do everything that it needed to. We would let the computer, you know, design and do all of those things. They make our cars. They do all the things that we see in the world. But you know what I have found? That with the explosion of technology, it hasn't made our life any easier. You know what it's done? It's made our life even tougher, and here's why. Because now all of a sudden, technology brings efficiencies in. And because of those efficiencies, you and I were taught something called a work ethic. And that work ethic said that if we are going to work 40 hours for our employer, that it better be 40 hours. But we ended up working 60 and 65 and 70 hours. Why? Because the computer and the technology age has made it so efficient that we find more available time to do more things. And it just continues to crowd us out and it continues um, to overwhelm us. I was thinking about the uh, person who designed the cell phone that allows you to get text messages and emails. And I'm thinking, you know, wow, what a convenience. Now you could be busy all the time. You could be walking down the street, answering your emails, texting people. Patty's going like, Bob, that's you. And, 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 and just doing all of those things and not even look up. And next thing you know, there was somebody who actually walked in a pond in a mall, a little fountain, because they were so busy texting and answering their emails. What have we become? We've become a hurried people. U.S. News and World Report ran an article a couple of eons back and what it said was that we've become a tired people. We've become such a busy people. We've become such a, a pe pe people that's constantly wanting to do things, constantly wanting to pursue things. That because we're constantly doing, we're constantly pursuing, we're constantly going after things, we're so busy, it said, that we seldom have time for the things of most importance. Now, I want you to think with a second with me here this morning. If I were to ask you what are the most important things in your life? I want you to catch those images right now. What are the top one, two, three things in your life right now? You know, for me, it would certainly be my relationship with God. It would be my, my family, and it would be, you know, uh, my friends that, that, that I love very dearly. And, of course, the vocation of the church, you know, that, that comes in a, a close fourth, you know. But, but the whole point is God, family, friends, and that's why we were created. But, you know, when you think about that, because of our hurried sickness— because of the, the kind of people that we've become, we get to that point that all of a sudden the things that are most important to us fall back. They get the scraps at the end of the day. I mean, how many times when your parents were alive, or maybe if they're alive now, and, and they live within a commutable distance, how many times do you find yourself, maybe your parents call you and say, you know, would, would you like to come visit me today? How many times do we catch ourselves saying, well, you know, Mom and Dad, I'd really love to come visit you today, but, but I got some stuff I got to do. That thing is still hanging over my head. And you end up not making that trip. Now, if you've been a parent or, or if you've had an opportunity to uh, work with kids, how about those moments where, where all of a sudden your children come to you? Maybe your son says, I want you to teach me how to throw a baseball. Maybe your daughter says, come have a tea party with me. Or whatever the case may be, help us with our homework. How many times do we catch ourselves saying, you know what? Mommy or Daddy's just really busy right now. We've got all this work to do. But as soon as we're done with all this work, man, we'll, you know, first thing, we'll, we'll spend some time with you. Only to find out that by the time you finish that thing that you have to do, that you've been working all day on, that's been taking all of your time, that they're sound asleep and the day has come to an end. Does that happen to you? You know, that's what hurried sickness does. That's what, that's what this busyness piece does. That's, that's the thing that it, that it comes and, 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 and um, uh, comes and takes over our lives. In fact, I, I'm one who truly believes that, that hurriedness and busyness has become a God that many of us worship. That we worship and we thrive on doing. We worship and we thrive on, on you know, climbing the corporate ladder. We worship and we thrive about being somebody who's important and all those things. As long as we're busy and we pursue that God of busyness. But God says to us, there can only be one God. And that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the, the God who came into the world as Jesus Christ. That's the same God who created everything. It's the same God who comes to us as the Holy Spirit and lives as the perpetual presence with us in everything that we are. 
But that hurried sickness, that busyness, that, that desire to pursue things at all costs is costing us, isn't it? In her book, uh, Not So Fast Slowing Down Solutions for Frenzied Families, Ann Croker writes this. Listen to this quote, and uh, you'll, you'll see it on the screen as well. America, the land of the high-achieving, multitasking speedaholics. I love that. We're in perpetual motion, never resting, never quite satisfied. American families are sucked into the vortex of activities and obligations. We pile on appointments. We pile on lessons and practices and games, performances and clubs, and then shovel in fast food. Western civilization's high-speed, fast-paced, goal-oriented life has propelled us into a state of minivan mania. Now... My, my guess is a lot of you are going like, wow, that describes me. Or it described a time in my life not long ago. How do you know about that? Well, let me tell you. <clears throat> I'm a recovering workaholic. I am. It's just like any other addiction. We find ways to feed it. And, and God doesn't want us to be addicted to those kinds of things. And we need to take and pull that step back. We need to find that time. We need to remember and reconnect with the one who has created us. And that's the challenge that we have as we suffer from hurry sickness. You know, we are a people of doers. You know, the Bible has all of these stories about discipleship. It has all these stories about servanthood. It has all of those images. And one of the um, most uh, renowned uh, images that we have is the story of Martha and Mary. And the two sisters, as one is preparing for Jesus to visit, and the other one, when Jesus arrives, sits at his feet. One is constantly doing. One is going through busyness, hurry sickness, all of those things, whereas the other one has quieted her heart. And she sits at the feet of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? That this is, this is the most value, the most valuable thing that can be done. And I think about that because you and I oftentimes get caught up in as long as we're doing God's work, it's okay that our lives are topsy-turvy. That we want to convince ourselves, well, I'm working for God and I'm serving God. And, and, and even at the expense of our families and at the expense of our, um, of our spiritual life. And I want to tell you that, that honestly, as I interpret the scriptures, God doesn't want us to be so busy about him and serving him that we forget to pray with him, that we forget to commune with him, that we forget about our families, that we forget about those that we love, that we're called to take care of, that, that all those things. That there's something about just being busy that I think God says there are times that we need to quiet and be still. And we are to remember, R-E apostrophe, member ourselves to him. One of my favorite scriptures is uh, 1 Samuel. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn with me. If you're uh, viewing with us at home today, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3. And I love this story. This is a great story that talks to us about how we are to quiet ourselves, how we are to overcome hurried sickness. Now, let me set this up. Uh, Samuel is a little boy at the time, and um, he is at a point where, where he has not really identified his, his identity with God. He really doesn't, hasn't identified his calling, his passion, his purpose. And it's at this moment that, that I believe that Samuel is struggling, just like we do, so busy about doing things and being a good person that he has failed to ever hear the voice of God. Now, the Scripture will tell us that in these days that, that the hearing the voice of God was not a common thing, which leads me to believe, like some of us say today, we don't hear the voice of God much today. It leads me to believe that even in the ancient world as we are today, that sometimes we find ourselves so busy that we say we don't hear God. Here's what it says. The boy Samuel missed ministered before the Lord under Eli. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was, laying, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli, and he said, here I am, you called me. And, Sam, and uh, Eli said, I didn't call, go back and lie down. So he went back 
and he lay down. And again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and he, he went to Eli and he said, Here I am, you called me. My son, he said, Eli said, I didn't call you, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. But the Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and he went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go back and lie down, and when he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood there, calling as if, as if the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, your servant is listening. Now what, what do we learn about this story with Samuel? I mean, what, why are we looking at this today when we're talking about hurriedness and busyness and, and hurried sickness? You know, as we read this, we realize that, that sometimes that, that God does speak to us, and God speaks to us audibly. God speaks to us through the scriptures. God speaks to us through other Christian brothers and sisters. God speaks us uh, through the church. God calls prophets. God, call, God calls pastors. God calls lay people. God speaks in many different ways. But one thing that we, that we struggle with sometimes is that so often we say, well, we've never heard God speak. Now I'll be the first to tell you that I have never in my life heard the audible voice of God. But what I have experienced in my life is impressions that are placed upon my heart, which are restlessness within my spirit, which are ways that guide me to know that God is speaking. And therefore, I am to pour my life into his word. I am to cluster myself with fellow believers. And I am to ask openly the questions as Samuel, speak, Lord, for now your servant is listening. You know, for some of us, it... Uh, the reason we don't hear God, maybe, maybe God is speaking to you. Maybe you're one of those ones, like in the biblical times, that God's audible voice is speaking to you, but you're not hearing it. You know, for some of us that aren't good listeners, maybe God needs to send us something that we can see, a tangible sign, like a flashing neon sign that says, wake up, I'm calling you, I'm trying to speak to you, pick up the phone, listen to me. But you know, God does speak, and we see examples in the Bible. God spoke to Moses. It was something called a burning bush, a theophany, which was um, God's presence in the midst of fire. And we know that through that, that the bush was not consumed. But, but Moses heard the word of God, which clearly said, take off your sandals, Moses. You're on holy ground. And God gave Moses the marching orders to go freed my people from captivity. We also know that as Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan, as he came up out of the water, the heavens opened up, the scripture said, and a voice came from the heavens and said, Behold my son, in whom I am most pleased. Even God's voice has been heard by those who persecute his church. Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus, the voice of Jesus comes to him, is an image, knocks him off of his horse, and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He was going out and killing Christians because of the word of Jesus Christ. And Saul recognizes and says, is that you, Lord? So God does speak, and there are those revelations that come. You know, my wife Patty's a school teacher, and one of the techniques that she uses when her students are getting rowdy and when they're getting overly excited about things is she starts to talk a little softer. And when you talk a little softer, what happens? People begin to listen because they want to really be in tune with what it is you're trying to say. So there is something about that still, small voice of God. I never really understood it. Why does it need to be a still, small voice? Why can't it be a clanging gong or a loud cymbal? It's because God wants our full attention. He wants us to stop the hurriness. He wants us to stop the busyness. He wants our entire attention to be poured out with him. A couple of years ago, um, there was something that, that really was a modern-day phenomena that changed the dynamics of the world. It was something called an acrostic. Now, uh, my wife, who is a master literary genius, she told me to say that this morning, especially the master part. But, but uh, you know, she is a, um, an English language arts professional, and... Um, you know, uh, she, she taught me something. The official term is called an acrostic. 
And an acrostic is where you take certain letters, and those letters mean something. And one of the greatest acrostics that we've had that through the years has really changed the entire spectrum of the world, in my opinion, were the four letters WWJD, right? WWJD, what does that mean? What would Jesus do? So when we think about busyness, when we think about hurriness, when we think about all of those things that, that come into play, then, then we should go back to that, that um, movement that, that was like something that lit the entire world on again. WWJD, what would Jesus do? But you know what? I have a challenge with that. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here, so don't send me unsigned letters. Don't send me signed letters. Don't send me emails. I'm just going to push something out there for a little bit to have you think about it. I think the theology behind WWJD was not correct. And let me tell you why I believe that. What would Jesus do poses a question to me. And it then engages me to answer the question. And depending upon my thought, my mood, my action, the circumstance that I'm in, I tell you what, I could pretty much justify that Jesus would be doing the same thing. Think about that. How many misinterpretations of Scripture do we have? How many people do we have charging their own agenda, saying, but that's what the Word of God says? So I think that instead of a WWJD, we need to change some of those letters. And the new acrostic needs to be WDJD. What did Jesus do? This book right here tells us exactly everything that he did. This is God's book of salvation. And, and uh, Tony Campolo calls it the words of red. That if you read the words of red, you'll know exactly what Jesus has done. And therefore, it takes away any kind of prejudice or any kind of slant that I might have on that. Now, that, you know, WDJD. So if some of you can figure out how we can make a mint on that, you know, we, we can pay off our, our building note here at the church, and we can continue to support the missionaries and the things that we need to do. So what did Jesus do? Go back to Mark's gospel for me, with me here. Go back to Mark 1, 35. And what we find out here is, as Susie was reading for us, you know, all of these things, he had just come off from healing. And this is a pattern for Jesus. He does healings. He does uh, feedings. He does teachings. He does all those things. And there's always something he does after he puts all of that time and energy. He withdraws, and he moves away from the crowds so that he can connect with the Father. As a pastor and as a layperson, I've heard often the expression, I don't go to that church anymore because I'm not being fed. Well, let me, let me now there's, there's two ways to look at that. One way is you always want to make sure there's credible teaching of God's Word. But the second way is, pulls us back to John 4, 4 34, where Jesus says, my food is found and doing the will of the Father. So therefore, in those moments where you and I are not being spiritually nurtured, when we feel that we're not being spiritually nurtured, Jesus himself says we must first examine ourselves. Are we doing the will of the Father? And just because we're doing things in the name of God doesn't mean that we're always doing the will of the Father. And it's in those moments that that, that busyness comes. And, and part of, you know, um, being in the will of the Father is to withdraw, to be in the presence of God, to be in the presence of the Father. Here's what it says in verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and went off to a solitary place where it is there that he prayed. Now I want to take you to another example. Go to uh, Mark chapter 14, flip over to that. We're going to go to verses 32 to 36, as well as verse 39. Mark 14. 32 to 36 through 39. Now, this is really important here because, again, what did Jesus do? And this is where the w WDJD comes in. What did he do? And we see here that, that he is coming at the end of his ministry. He's coming to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's that night that he becomes arrested. He's betrayed by Judas. He's arrested. He's beaten, ultimately goes to the cross. And as we're thinking about this, you know, um, knowing that, that Jesus himself is coming to the end of his ministry, we have to remember something called the incarnation. Incarnation means that, that Jesus was deity, he was God, but we also have to remember he was man. So this God-man was a constant wrestling going on into his life. And it was that that we see a lot of the humanness that comes out in Jesus. 
And therefore, here he is in Gethsemane, and he's at this point where he's feeling the sin of the world, and it's crushing his spirit. And he's getting to that point in his life where he's been busy teaching, he's been busy healing, he's been busy doing all of those things of ministry. And what does he do? He withdraws for prayer. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John, and along with him, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. That hurriedness, that busyness is catching up to him. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Why? Because there are still people who are not aware. There was still work to be done. He's thinking about the busyness, the end of the day, the tasks. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Then he says, Abba, Father. The, the Greek word Abba is translated into a child's call, Daddy. So he says, Daddy God, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you want. And then down to verse 39, once more, he went away and he prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. What did Jesus do? I mean, certainly he was at a point where, where there were uh, healings that needed to be done. He was at a point where more people needed to know about the kingdom's purpose. There were more things that he needed to do, but he found himself in that time of prayer. He created Sabbath. And in that position of Sabbath, he had gotten to that place where he realized it was time to nourish his soul. Let me read to you um, a quote out of, uh, out of Solitude, a book by writer and theologian Henry Nouwen. Uh, Henry Nouwen is, was a Catholic priest. He's dead now, gone to life eternal. But um, what a profound writer. Here's what he says. In the lonely place... Jesus finds the courage to follow God's will and not his own, to speak God's words and not his own, to do God's work and not his own. He reminds us constantly, by myself I can do nothing. I seek to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Somewhere, now in writes, we know that without a lonely place, our lives are in danger. Somewhere we know that without silence, words lose their meaning, that without listening, speaking no longer heals, that without distance, closeness cannot cure. Somewhere we know that without a lonely place, our actions quickly become empty gestures. The careful balance between silence and words, withdrawal and involvement, distance and closeness. Solitude and community forms the basis of Christian life and should therefore be the subject of our most personal attention. If we're tired, if we're weary, whatever the case is, his promise is to meet us there and to renew us. Be still, be quiet, and know that I am God. 